Okay, hello everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hi guys. Hello, we are live. This is the episode number six of All Roads Lead to a Pro. That is this cool format with all our sponsor, bounty sponsor, partners, uh, and all the 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 project and people involved uh, in the Etro Hackathon to be prepared for for the hackathon. So today. I'm super excited because we have uh, Kirsten from Talent Layer. Um, so hello, Chris, Kirsten, and thanks to be here. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Excited to share. Yeah, that's great. And also we have Drun from, from Urbe, from Itrom. Hi, guys. Yeah, how are you guys? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm very excited uh, for having you here, Kirsten, and uh, we are very excited about Ton Layer and uh, like the way it improves uh, the uh, Web three ideas and uh, turning into projects. And so maybe I don't know if we want to start with a brief introduction about Ton Layer in general. I don't know if you want to share the screen if you have any presentation. So sure. Yeah, so we can get started with a little presentation. So let me share my screen. Am I presenting right now, actually? Yeah. Great, right, great. OK, so you can see this now? Yes. OK, great. So um, today we'll be talking a little bit about Talent Layer. Um, before we jump into that, I'll give a brief intro to myself. So I'm Kirsten, one of the founders of Talent Layer. And um, my background, so for the past four years, I've been building different things in the blockchain space. I started off doing blockchain governance um, work for a number of enterprise blockchain projects, and then um, moved to the decentralized side of things, um, did a lot of open source work, and then uh, earlier last year founded Talent Layer. Um, actually, yeah, earlier last year. It's been just about one year exactly. Um, and before that, I had a number of Web2 startups, um, mostly marketplace type things. And uh, I was doing that um, on the side of being like a freelance developer. So always was, you know, hunting for work and, and then funneling the money that I earned as a freelancer into paying more freelancers to build my startups. So uh, I basically got really familiar with a lot of the issues of hiring on both sides of the market. And um, that's what led me to Talent Layer. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues with hiring platforms today. We're going to talk about a concept that's become a, a pattern really in platform design um, that's fueled by Web3. So this is more of a general concept, building better platforms. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how you can build new sorts of platforms using Talent Layer. Um, for you know the future of work. So today's work platforms. So generally, if you're looking for a job or if you're hiring, you're using platforms. Like, and and this is not limited to just what you think of as a job board or a freelance marketplace, but it's also things like Uber. Uber is a hiring platform, or Glovo Food Delivery is a hiring platform. Um, Teladoc is a hiring platform. And unfortunately, because we have so, so, so many of these platforms and they're all um, sort of trying to have these captive user bases, you have really dramatic market fragmentation. So while you have people that are looking for work on one platform and people that are trying to hire on another platform, it's kind of rare that you have an even amount of hires and workers that are looking for the same thing on one platform alone. And this is uh, really the biggest thing that causes friction in hiring. So additionally, because you have all these platforms operating independently, especially on gig style platforms where users do build a reputation over time, you have the issue of reputation fragmentation. So anyone that's freelanced out there, uh, myself included, like usually we're using multiple platforms and you have maybe some great reviews on one platform, but if you're on another platform, maybe the hires there can't see everything, you have to charge a lower rate, it's a whole thing. So in addition to all this, there's also issues of censorship, geographic bans, shadow bans, all the things that happen on traditional platforms. And this problem is bigger than just hiring technology, which is why we've been seeing a sort of new type of platform evolve. Uh, in fact, platforms that sort of 
separate the network effect from the platform itself. So let me talk about what that means a little bit. So what the heck is a network effect platform, a network effect startup in general? So this is anything that requires a big mass of users for the platform to have value. So you can think social media, e-commerce marketplaces like Amazon. You can think of um, hiring marketplaces like Upwork um, or Uber. And the, the thing is, is like um, right now, all these platforms are completely fragmented. And what we've been seeing is as of recently, um, there have been people experimenting with lower level graphs that basically create a base layer for many platforms to build on. One example of that is Lens Protocol. So Lens Protocol is a social graph. They have developer toolkits to build social media platforms that all have an interoperable user base and social posts. And we've just like scratched the surface of seeing all the cool things you can build with Lens. So the anatomy of one of these, you know, graph uh, startups is you got one low level, low level protocol, then you have you know, some middleware indexers that help interfaces read the data and write the data sometimes. Um, and then you have platforms of different types. So you can imagine on Lens Protocol, a graph uh, or an, an anatomy like this would look like you have maybe Lenster over here, Orb over here. They're all touching that lower level protocol, which is Lens. And um, what's great about this sort of model is you have one low level protocol. Um, and what that means is you can actually have interactions between users that are using different platforms. And it doesn't really matter as much where a user is. Um, it also means that if users are for some reason banned from one platform, they can go access another platform. Um, platforms also can have plenty of monetization, differentiation, other services on top of that. They don't all look the same. Um, that's part of the point. Another, a few graph type projects, XMTP is also sort of structured in this style of architecture. Talent layer as well. Um, we're targeting work as a market. And now we can talk a little bit about, OK, well, generally, we know the structure of talent layer now. We know the structure of this new type of platform economy, open graph economy. Um, but what exactly can you build with talent layer? How does it work? So with talent layer specifically, what we have at the lowest level protocol is all of the backend components that you need to build hiring platforms. So think user reputation, service agreements, um, messaging, review systems, dispute resolution. And then you can have any number of platforms on top of that. Um, so because um, these core components are at a lower level, you can have um, a hirer that maybe is on one platform. So platform B, maybe there's a hire that posts this blue job over here. Um, on platform B, this uh, user would be able to actually search and they will see the user profiles that are just at the protocol level in general. Those may have been posted by platform A or they could have been posted by someone completely other. Um, and what that means is you can actually even out the network effects across these platforms and create more efficient hiring relationships. So you don't have to like as a worker search across a bunch of different platforms, manage a bunch of accounts, have a bunch of reputations. And as a hire, you also don't have to do that on a bunch of different platforms, a bunch of different recruiting agencies. So with Talent Layer, um, like you can build really like so many different sorts of service marketplaces, everything from like ride sharing um, to um, freelance marketplaces, um, like doctor marketplaces, pretty much anything, babysitting marketplaces. And when it comes to the actual like, you know, nitty gritty tech of it, I'll briefly go through this. And then if you guys want to dump into more later, we can. Um, but we have modules that handle identity, jobs and proposals, escrow, dispute resolution, reviews, and more. Um, we also have a few platforms that are already live with Talent Layer. So Talent Layer uh, launched on Mainnet just a few months ago, so not, not very long. Um, but we have one platform that's live on Mainnet um, in a public beta. That's WorkX. Um, you could go use them today. And we have another that is in a private beta on Mainnet. And then 
um, about 13 more that are in the process of building on testnet right now. So just a few more ideas of what you can build. Lots of things. Amazon Mechanical. A lot of things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically that's the gist. So um, I can give you know more information on Talent Layer, but also shout out, we're completely open source. So we have just been built by a team of over 25, I think now, contributors over the course of the past year. So if you're also into open source contribution, we got bounties, we got stuff that needs to get built. So hit me up. Thank you, Kirsten. That's great. And, oh, oh sorry. Oh, Drun, I remove you from the live. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have the first question from our friend, the Lemon. And Lemon is asking, what's the pro of protocol first versus protocol first approach for things like talent, talent layer? So um, I believe what he's talking about is for go-to-market strategy. So when building open graphs like this, there's two different ways to go about it. So um, we'll use the analogy of Lens Protocol versus Uniswap, because Uniswap is also the same sort of ecosystem structure. It's yeah. one level protocol, many interfaces. So Uniswap chose to, um, they have like a company and they built an interface and then they have the smart contracts that they published. Those smart contracts, those are gonna be around forever. The, this is the low level protocol, the open graph. But they built the first big flagship application on top of that. And because of that, they're able to drive a lot of traffic and then build up enough of a network effect for um, trading pairs that other interfaces, it was like, you know, worth their time to build and use the same low level protocol. So basically they bootstrap the protocol via their really shiny front end. The other option is what Lens did. So Lens has very intentionally not themselves maintained a marketplace because the thing is, is if you go the Uniswap route, then you risk becoming a sort of pseudo monopoly, which in Uniswap's case, they still do have most of the traffic, right? Whereas the way that Lens is building is if the Lens team does not run their own platform, um, but rather you have a bunch of the, the community members, people in the ecosystem, just building platform, 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 then they all have like a greater chance of being able to succeed individually. And in the meantime, Lens can do things to support those projects and help them grow faster. So Talent Layer is taking the approach that is more like Lens. So we do not currently have any sort of like flagship interface. We're happy to support WorkX, happy to support like all of the other platforms building on Talent Layer and want to continue doing that. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lemon, for the, the interesting question. So I have a question for you, Kristen, because I feel like um, Talent Layer has two different targets. Uh, one, of course, are customers, so people using all the platforms built on top of the Talent Layer protocol. And then, of course, you have developers or, in general, people who wants to integrate and to create something, to build something on top of the, on the Talent Layer protocol. So specifically for this um, second category, so for developers, uh, what do you offer uh, so, I mean, framework, SDK, something like that. And also, why a developer should use the Talent Layer SDK or framework or whatever instead of uh, building something from scratch? Hmm. So, um, first of all, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why use Talent Layer versus something else. So, the main benefit of Talent Layer is the network effect, right? So. If you build a hiring application that's on Talent Layer, then that means that you get to basically bootstrap yourself um, alongside a lot of other marketplaces. So it's the same thing as if you build a social media platform on Lens, automatically you get like a really huge reach, right? So granted, Talent Layer is a lot more early stage than Lens, and we don't have like as many users at the protocol level yet. But um, as the current marketplaces and as the new marketplaces that are building, um, themselves bootstrap, and that means more access to the network effect for everyone that's building. 
So that's the main benefit. Another really big benefit for builders that are just getting started is we've got a lot of stuff built, right? Like if you only have to focus on your front end and you have escrow contracts, dispute resolution, um, reputation management, all of that, crypto native, like if you have all of that already there for you, then you can go to market in a few days as opposed to like, you know, months and months and months of engineering. Um, so one team that we talked with, they had estimated that it was going to be like eight, nine months um, and ended up being more like three. So, um, and in fact, WorkX, um, they were able to finish their integration in like a four week sprint, um, like right before we did our mainnet launch. So um, this also makes it really appealing for hackathons because you can build like full feature hiring applications just using the tools that we have. What are those tools though? So um, as of right now, um, September 15th, we have um, basically a starter code base. We have a lot of code snippets. We have a lot of really great documentation, pages, pages worth. Check out our docs, docs.talentlayer.org. Um, but of course, everyone wants an SDK. And uh, this is the first time that I am saying this ever publicly. SDK v0.1 is coming for Ethereum. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. So um, we didn't think that this was possible, but luckily we were able to figure it out. So yeah, it's on track to be ready right before Ethereum starts. So granted, this is a very, very early version. <laughs> so um, for folks that, that are keen on testing out new tech, definitely check that out. Um, and of course, as backup options, we still have all of the other great stuff that teams have been using for months. Um, so yeah, that's what we got. Thank you. Oh, yeah. But well, this thing is huge, actually. So hackers will be capable of implementing your SDK for the first time. So also for you, it will be interesting. Like, oh my uh, God, seeing. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's, that's very good. And so actually I had a question, like uh, I, I love the fact that uh, via the talent layer architecture, uh, like a worker or a hire can uh, edge those uh, network effects that you were saying, because actually like uh, generating a marketplace on top of the talent layer architecture means at the same time being part of a huge network of marketplaces as well. And so my question to you is, and probably it's related to the models that you were saying before that maybe we could have a deep dive into them, but like uh, for what regards the profiling of the users of talent layer, both uh, workers and uh, hirers or employers, employees, uh, as you might want to call them, like uh, what's the process in that case? Like uh, are users allowed to uh, selectively disclose uh, personal data? Uh, how strict is the disclosure process of the personal data and stuff like that? And also like um, on a technical perspective, where these kind of information are stored if they are on chain or on uh, decentralized architecture? Yes. So at the protocol level, we always want to be storing the minimum viable data. So for work use cases, uh, basically we looked at across all of these different very diverse use cases, what are the data fields that are consistently required? Um, so this is the first characteristic or the, the first like, I don't know, thing that we looked at when designing what data do we collect? Um, the second thing that we wanted to look at is how do we not gather any personal identifiable information and store that on chain or into centralized storage? Because that in general is a no-no for like GDPR compliance, for just personal security, like not, not a good thing. So um, basically the minimum viable data structures that we have is not personal identifiable information, um, but... Um, basically, yeah, but basically the only, only required characteristic is just, you need a unique identifier and that is the talent layer ID. Um, so this is similar to a lens handle. And if you have that talent layer ID, you don't need anything else. You can still interact with the ecosystem. You can be hired and, or you could hire others as well. Um, so what this means is it's a very, a non-friendly, um, but if you want, you can also provide a bunch of other information. 
So there are optional fields for everything from, you know, nickname to title, keywords, about section, stuff like that. Platforms can also choose to, um, I guess, you know, request specific information that they want or just not prompt users for certain information. For example, if a platform, um, because of maybe the jurisdiction that they're building in, um, needs to make sure that users are not from specific countries, then what they can do is they can say that, okay, we're only going to read in from the protocol profiles that have their location marked and that maybe have gone through some sort of verification of that location. So there's a lot of like really dynamic, like, I guess, search that you can do on that lower level pool of talent, jobs, worker, um, and hires. Um, but it really depends on like how the platform's configuring it. Okay, perfect. That clear answer. Thank you. And uh, yeah, also maybe Frank, I don't know if you have any question about. I would like also to dive into. You can go. Uh, you can go. Yeah. Okay. Because also for for what regards like uh, the asynchronous way of uh, posting a job and applying for a job, right? And also the the relation that underlying relationship that uh, like surges between the employers and the employees, because like. Uh, how how this process is handled like uh, what's the process of uh, generating a uh, uh, job position and what's the process for applying for such job position and how do you handle the fiduciary component between uh, employer and employee because of course like a worker could uh, uh, like um, give a service and at the same time uh, how he has the opportunity of seeing a commitment of payment by the mm. worker. So I don't know if you uh, like uh, could elaborate a bit more about this thing here. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, I, I remembered that I, I missed a part from your last question. Where's the data stored? Um, so we're on Polygon. So there is some data that's stored on Polygon and then for long form data that's stored on IPFS. But moving on to your current question. Um, so first I'll give you how it works with Talent Layer, the protocol. And then I'll give you some options on how it could be configured in front ends, because like usual, there's a lot of different options. So at the protocol level, the most simple explanation is, is you're a hirer or you have a talent layer ID, you're acting as hire, you create job post. I have another talent layer ID. I look at that, I submit a proposal. This proposal is now associated with this job post. And you uh, review any posts that have been submitted and you approve one. After it has been approved, uh, in the same transaction, you submit the money that was agreed to into escrow. So me as a worker, I can see, okay, that money is good, it's there, I can do my work, and then I come back, and um, the work I submit, and then the hirer says release, and then signs the transaction releasing the escrow. If there is a situation where there is a dispute, so maybe, the hirer disagrees with the worker, vice versa, then it can be taken to dispute resolution. So currently the option for dispute resolution on Polygon is um, it's platform managed dispute resolution. So basically if hire and worker are using a platform or even different platforms, wherever the job post was posted, that platform decides uh, what happens here. So they would have a customer support agent reviewing cases. So we also do have an integration with Claros built. So Claros is a decentralized court system that is honestly much better than handling disputes manually, but they're not on Polygon yet. So um, we are just waiting for them to deploy there, should be within the next six months or so. Um, and then we are also in the process of exploring um, other options for dispute resolution like UMA. Basically, our job is to provide you guys all the options and then you could turn on, turn off whatever you want. So that's how it works at the protocol level. When it comes to how platforms can configure it, I mean, like, it, it can really vary. So, for example, if you want to make a bounty board and you have 100K for a bug bounty or something, what you can do is um, you say, I've got a 100K bug bounty, and then people submit the work and then um, so that the job would be posted when you create the bug bounty. When people submit work, 
that work would be submitted as proposals actually. And then um, whoever you actually want to pay out um, on the back end, it selects that proposal. Um, and then you immediately trigger the release of payment. So that's a way to do bounty flow. You could also do like milestone based payments. So maybe when you post the job, you have some specifications saying, yeah, it's going to be in three milestones. And then even though it's like, it's all the same on talent layers level, the front end can just say, um, okay, trigger release of 13% of funds upon milestone completion A. And then upon B, this percent. And upon C, this percent. Um, so, and if you want, you could also do things like um, have multiple jobs, like m multiple like literal jobs on the protocol for one contract. So maybe like you have a 10 month hiring engagement on one of these like long-term um, platforms. So maybe something like a long-term offshoring marketplace where you wanna hire someone to work with your team as an embedded engineer for a while. Um, you don't wanna put like 10 months of payment in an escrow up front. That doesn't work with your cash flow. So how you would architect a system like that is um, for each month maybe, or for every two weeks, maybe you put the money into escrow. So that would mean each month would be a separate job post and would have 100% of the funds released by the, the end of that month. But we get really technical. I, I don't know if the audience uh, wants to get like super in the details, but if you do, let me know because I can go deeper. <laughs> no, I mean, like uh, it is uh, totally good at, at the end of the day, like people are going to hack these, uh, these protocols. So That's eventually true. the more information you give, uh, the, the easier is uh, hacking your, your, your platform. And so, yeah, maybe we have a lot of questions here. That, that yeah. Mean, uh, about it. Yeah, we have this super interesting question from Lemon, in my, in my opinion. And I want to add something about this. Because Lemon asked, well, what's the most difficult thing in being the, the main steward of an open protocol? And I, wa I want to add something. And I want to ask you, are you trying to, um, to, to create a, a direction or in general some guidelines for people in um that wants to build on talent layer or and also right now can people build something without uh talking with you so completely even in independently uh, or and or maybe something in that is planned for the future so I'll, I'll take your second question first, and then I'll, I'll loop back to the other one in the yeah. So, um, So basically anyone can get started and build a full platform on testnet without talking to us at all. If you want a mainnet platform ID, you do have to submit a request. Reason for this is if we do not do this right now, then we could get spammed a lot. Yeah, and the platforms that are on talent layer um, currently, like they would rather not have a bunch of stuff to sift through. Um, and this sort of like, you know, in the long term gets into the economic model of talent layer where we will have incentive mechanisms around, um, you know, properly labeling things and disincentives for bad actors that post spam and, and stuff like that. But that's like very long in the maturation journey of talent layer. Um, so going back to being main steward of open protocol. So right now with talent layer, like we're, we're a lot of people, right? But we all sort of move as one. So we don't have necessarily something like the Ethereum community where you have pods of people working under a bunch of different entities in different countries and their teams. And sometimes they talk to each other, but mostly they're operating independently. We don't really have that yet. That'd be awesome one day, but not yet. Um, we all run on the same sprints. So that means we really do set a lot of the vision for the protocol. Um, in many ways we do. In other ways, we've tried not to, and things have sort of happened just d by default. But one thing that comes to mind relating to that is we, for a long time, really wanted to not push people in a specific direction as far as like what platform you should build on talent layer, because 
it's like, yeah, build whatever you want. You can use it for so many things. Um, but we realized uh, that literally all the teams, except for one, I think, building on talent layer are building developer marketplaces. Um, so it's like they were doing that without us, you know, requesting that or advocating for it or publicizing that. But it ended up being like a really smart thing, because if you look at why developer marketplaces would be a good entry market, it's because this is high margin. So generally you have like a lot of money moving around because developers are well paid. Um, you have a ton of existing developer marketplaces. It's a huge share of the market. One of the reasons for that is developers are tech savvy. Who would have thought? Um, and developers are also location independent. You can hire them wherever you are in the world. So if you compare like a group, like say, say you have um, just a hiring platform, not even talent layer, and you have a hundred developers in there and you have a hundred hirers in there, you can facilitate a lot of matches, um, even if those people are scattered all over the world. But if you have something like an Uber and you have 100 people looking for a ride and 100 people that are driving, but they're all in different cities, in different countries, that's not going to do anyone any good. So what that means is if many teams are building something in a similar vertical, especially a location independent vertical, then the network effects bootstrapping is so much faster. So because of that, we've been trying to, I mean, we're not like super heavy handed about it. Obviously during this discussion, I just told you build whatever you want. Um, but we think people should build developer marketplaces. We think that the ecosystem is the most valuable for people building developer marketplaces right now. So, okay, Th that's a good idea for, for hackers. I don't know if I tackled what was the most difficult thing, though. I talked about being a steward in general. So, um, <laughs> um, I feel like uh, if I if I can say something about that, because yeah. I feel like, for example, you or, for example, the Lens team um, regarding the Lens ecosystem um, or Farcaster. So, in general, these open protocols, there should be someone uh, giving um, a, some guidelines okay so so i'm gonna guidelines to follow because otherwise um everyone can do anything so is yeah. that a complex thing to do i mean that yeah i mean that i would say most of my thoughts around complicated things are relating to that um It's, it's like, I, I think of it more as like, how heavy handed do you want to be? Mm. Because, I mean, you can, you can say like, only build this kind of thing. We're going to do this together because it's the best for the network effects. Or you can be more like, yeah, build whatever you want, dude. But it'd be great if you could build this. Um, so in talks with VCs, one really interesting thing has been like, They, they, a lot of them have advocated on one firm target market. So in general, and, and it was literally because of the network effect stuff, because in the beginning we were talking to so many people building like really niche marketplaces like food delivery in Sweden, or um, there was this marketplace in New York City that was being built for... Uh, for like restaurant workers, um, because restaurant workers have a lot of turnover, um, no reputation system, stuff like that. And like use cases like that are so, so exciting and cool, but it's really just not as powerful for those use cases right now. Because if you, if you have like one city, like you need at least a few marketplaces in that one city for something that's geolocation dependent for that to work. So it's just a lot harder. Um, but yeah, I would say like broadly speaking, difficult thing is like knowing how heavy handed to be with advocating people building in a certain way. Um, and also knowing how much, um, like what we can do versus what is the marketplace's responsibility, right? Because on our end, we want to bootstrap this protocol. 
like we want to get adoption, um, but we also don't want to manage our own marketplace. That's not our business. We want to leave that to the marketplaces. So figuring out ways to support them or also supporting hires and workers interacting directly with the protocol is stuff we're focused on. So let me focus on that last part a little bit. Normally in, you know, in, in everyone's understanding of marketplace world before today, it was not possible for some individual actor to access a marketplace and a network effect without going through some sort of intermediary. But with something like talent layer, it's possible to you for you to have even something like a one interface that you host on a computer in your basement. And that is just the thing that you use to search for jobs. And because it uses the same backend as all the other platforms, you can still handle the escrow, you can handle dispute resolution, you can have all these things. So thank you, PG. <laughs> You're crazy. Um, so, so basically what this means is um, like, you can actually directly bootstrap the protocol with workers and hirers by just empowering them with self-hosted stuff. So this is something that we've been looking at a lot recently. Um, and we're in the process of like specking something to basically allow hirers to easily embed white labeled um, job boards on their platforms. So, or rather on like their own hiring sites. So things like that is what we're looking at, but like that's been a whole year's worth of discussion on like, you know, should we do this to this extent to that, to that extent, but yeah. Okay, that's great. So um, I have a, another question related to talent layer IDs. Um, so are they sold on tokens? So are they linked to your wallet or can you transfer these IDs? So talent layer IDs are something in between. So we think we may have invented this thing. Um, basically, they are uh, they're transferable until you start building a reputation. So what that means is you can actually have a secondary market for them as long as someone has not used them. So think of it as, I don't know, collectible underwear. This is using a very weird analogy. You wouldn't want to use the collectible underwear. You're not going to do that, but you can trade them. <laughs> and until someone uses them, then they're exchangeable. So... So basically what happens is you mint a talent layer ID. Um, you can only mint one into a wallet. So if you want to mint a bunch, you need a bunch of wallets. Um, and then you can sell it, you can trade it, you can move around however much you want. But the moment that you do a action interacting with the talent layer smart contracts, so that could be adding profile information. It could be posting a job. It could be submitting a proposal. It could be really much of anything. Um, at that point where you take that action, locked forever to that wallet. Um, and yeah, so basically the idea behind why it has to be soul bound is you don't want people to be able to have a secondary market for reputations. So generally speaking, having it be tied to the wallet prevents a lot of um, sort of malicious activity around reputation trading. Of course, you can still have people sell their wallets, but then you know very few people do that because you always have the threat of being hacked if you use that wallet because the other person has access to the keys. So, yeah, I see that. No, it's totally clear. And uh, actually, I had I had a question because, like, suppose that uh, I am a marketplace who wants to build on top of Talent Layer. It seems that uh, as a marketplace, I need to handle three main process that are the matching between the hire and the worker, the agreement between them, and at the same time, the settlement of the transaction via the escrow account. And so typically, like uh, in the traditional setting, all these three acts uh, comes with uh, legal responsibilities because as you were saying, uh, this kind of stuff is performed by a third party fiduciary intermediary. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was wondering, according to you, and of course, maybe uh, on the legal side, it's something that it's... Uh, different it's another pair of shoes but at the same time uh, do you see the opportunity of using uh, a decentralized and deterministic eventually protocol as talent layer 
as a way for edging this kind of legal responsibilities or does it come to your mind any possible threat or opportunity in this kind of sense? So as of right now, what we do is we we recommend that the platforms do things like have their own legal agreements that they create between workers and hirers and have financial agreements about use of the escrow and have dispute resolution agreements and stuff like that. So even though these platforms are using um, like, you know, this low level protocol, that's no different from a platform using, I don't know, PayPal or banking infrastructure. Like you still got to have your contracts. You still got to have everything, um, everything as compliant as you would normally have. And that is a matter of uh, where your jurisdiction is. It's a matter of what your risk tolerance is as a platform. All builders are different, but generally people do have, you know, all these normal contracts. As far as um, using talent, so that's such, a, such an interesting question, by the way, um, like using talent layer to hedge against traditional financial agreements. So I would say um, one, one thing comes to mind that a lot of the marketplaces have, have been really excited about, and that's the decentralized dispute resolution, right? Because no one wants to have the legal liability as a platform of accidentally deciding that the worker should get the money, but actually the hire is getting screwed and there was a whole situation and the customer service agent was having a bad day and didn't read things properly. And then you have a lawsuit, right? No one wants that. So the thing is, is um, when you are able to have decentralized dispute resolution, then not only can you have like in a situation like Claros, you can have many, many like jury members reviewing every specific case, increasing the likelihood that you have like a outcome that is going to be, we'll say the most logical um, because it's going over many eyes. Um, but also you're able to do a bit of liability shift depending on the marketplace, depending on what protocol is used for dispute resolution. Um, basically, as long as you have your users sign appropriate contracts, you know, basically saying that they agree to use whatever protocol for dispute resolution, um, the role of the dispute resolution protocol is basically the same as a private mediator. That's how it's sort of seen in most countries. Yeah, I see that. It seems that the Claros integration will be a super huge milestone for oh five years. Yeah. I know. <laughs> We've been waiting yeah. on your V2. So the, the V2 is live on testnet. They just need to get it on Mumbai testnet and then on mainnet. It's on some other testnets. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, so probably we can move to Ethereum and uh, like uh, the, the involvement of a uh, layer on Ethereum. I don't know, Frank, if you have any take about this, this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for sure, Talent Layer, Talent Layer will be a bounty sponsor in Ethereum with a bounty of two thousand and five hundred dollar. I'm I'm correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so. First question, very easy. So, what what do you expect from from the hackathon? And and then, if you can share maybe some ideas um, for for hackers to build on top of talent layer. So, um, what do I expect for the hackathon? Um, so, I expect Roman togas. I expect chariots. I expect a lot of carbonara. And I expect very vibey decorations, probably with gold and leaves. This is what I'm expecting. This is what I Ooh. have heard rumors of. So I'm very excited for that. I think it's going to be a vibe completely different than all of the other like hackathons that I've been to recently, because it seems like everyone's doing the same theme these days. It's like everyone's got like the nice flowery Ethereum logo with the greens hanging off, but you can do so much more than that. So I'm excited about what you guys are planning for that. Um, as far as what we expect from the hackathon, this is what we're really excited about. So like, I know so many people that like, that like I've hacked with before or that I've met like other hackathons all coming to Ethereum. And I think it's gonna be a really great turnout. Um, I think that there's a lot of really freaking cool sponsors. Like who gets status to sponsor? Who gets Wapu coming out? Yeah, to that's true. That's wild. I've never heard of that before. Also, um, ENS rarely does hackathons. Usually they do conferences. So like major props to you guys. It will be super cool to, to hack with all of those teams. 
Um, and specifically with Talent Layer, what we're doing is we are making our bounty um, broad so that basically you can use our work features, you can fork our contracts, you can do documentation improvements, you can do pretty much anything as long as you do it creatively. And, um, and like, I really want to share more details, but I know that the official announcement is a little bit later. So just know that you can really let your creativity run free and uh, working on talent layer bounty will also be compatible with most of the other bounties out yeah. there. Um, so as far as what you can build, I mean, I sort of, uh, I, I went over some of the possibilities earlier, but um, we prepared this notion with, I think about 15 possible ideas with details, there are drop downs. So we try to hook you guys up with all the ideas, not limited to these, of course, and just a few. Um, we'd be stoked for like a food delivery app. So if you imagine like, I don't know, building some sort of MVP where someone can order Red Bulls or pizza or something, and then you run around delivering, that'd be freaking awesome. Um, so another thing that would be really cool to see is more usage of AI. So specifically, um, AI agent marketplaces. So if anyone knows about Mechanical Turk, like um, sort of an analogy, Mechanical Turk has been around for like a decade. And what it is, is it's a marketplace for very small pieces of easy work that are now really done by humans. So an example is you send um, the marketplace a receipt and then someone is assigned to review the receipt and type out um, the details of the receipt. So a lot of that stuff can be just done by AI now. So imagine building um, a tool or like a marketplace where you can just like send different AIs, different tasks, and maybe the owner of that AI creates a paywall and the AI earns the money from escrow when it delivers the work to you, stuff like that. That'd be super cool. Um, also like lending apps based on work history would be pretty damn cool. So this is something that I'm really excited about being more of a thing like five years from now when there's a lot of reputation information available on chain. Because right now in DeFi lending, it's all heavily collateralized, right? And the reason that in the, the like, you know, meat world, the, the, you know, the banking world, we don't have to have things super collateralized is because we do have very firm reputation, right? We have the credit system. We also have enforceability of contracts by, um, you know, governments affiliated with the banks and stuff like that. But we're getting to the point where we do have decentralized judiciary. We do have um, ways to have reputation managed. And specifically, if you are generating a lot of work history, this is something that has a lot of utility for financial applications like lending and also things like insurance and stuff like that. So that'd also be cool. Also, I don't know, GitHub integrated bounty automation would be pretty swaggy. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on forever, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have the whole notion doc for you guys. Yeah, I feel like the AI marketplace is a great idea because we have the Brian bounty. So you can do uh, the Brian bounty with a talent layer bounty. Yeah, it could be called Brian Works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this could be monetization for you guys. Damn, someone needs to build that. That's a great idea, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have um, a question from, from Paolo, from Orblue. Is it possible to develop on Talent Layer without having a land sample? Absolutely. So common misconception, Talent Layer is not built on lens like we don't have any like dependency with this lens. It's just, we're sort of sisters, right? Like you can build applications that use lens and use talent layer, but you can also build applications that just use talent layer. So um, if you don't have a lens handle, that doesn't matter. Also for the record, even if you don't have a lens handle, you can still build on lens. You're just building on testnet because they do have a way to like 
infinitely mint handles on testnet. Just FYI. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, maybe my final take, uh, or, well, my final question could be like, uh, according to you, um, there is instead any project that you do not suggest to, to push, maybe because they could be too ambitious to be performing three days, or maybe because uh, they, they, are, they could be not that original compared to what has been uh, already worked on. So because uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you are a judge, you need to reward also the, the fact that it's something totally new and totally different. Yeah. I would say we definitely love creative things. So yeah, um, as far as, you know, things that are too ambitious, I mean, I'll leave that to you guys to decide as hackers, you choose whatever you feel like you, your capacity is. Um, I would say the most vanilla flavor thing you can build on Talent Layer is probably a freelance marketplace. Like mm -hmm. I love all the freelance marketplaces building on Talent Layer, but for hackathons, mm -hmm. this is where You got to get inspired. You got to make flashy, cool things for the judges. So, yeah, I personally very like the idea of uh, taking the on chain reputation of the worker as uh, uh, a component uh, for the credit worthiness on other protocols. This is very mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, because at the end of the day, like uh, the fact that the Tony Layer ID is uh, soul bounded, it makes also uh, like it is an edge against the uh, reputation trading that you were mentioning before and so it's something mm -hmm. that of course is uh it could be something i would say so yeah yeah that's very cool yeah that's great Dr bruno you should attend the hackathon <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 are you allowed to do that <laughs> okay yeah. my, my, fa my final question is do you have any general tips for hackers oh yeah so not re not related to talent layer but in general yeah so um so like talent layer crew has been going to hackathons almost every month for like the past year i met my co-founder at a hackathon we went to like five hackathons in a row last year and we lost all of them we did not win a single bounty and we realized that we were doing everything wrong and then like beginning of this year we started winning and slowly we realized why we were winning and now we got the playbook So basically, here's what you guys got to do. Assign someone to talk to people. Like, bounty sponsors want to be talked to. If you just code alone, like, you're not going to have people remember you. And relationships matter a lot. Even if we all wish that hackathons were only based on the code that you ship, relationships do matter a lot. Um, and the reason that the sponsors are there is to talk to you. So also they get lonely at some hackathons <laughs> sponsors and they're just waiting for people to come up and it's sad. Like, no, you gotta go talk to people. So there's that, that will already increase your chances of winning things by a lot, I think. Um, so also pick things that are easily able to be demoed. So you always get bonus points by building mobile first because it's like really sleek and easy for people to like hold in their hands and and do stuff with. Um, I mean, even if you are a web app, like just make sure that you can have a, a working demo, recommend putting it on Versal. Um, that will score you a lot of points. Also just generally speaking, like having someone on your team that's at least a little bit design oriented is useful. So even if you build something like wicked cool on the back end, if the judges can't see how it's usable, for an end person, then you're probably going to lose out on points. So granted, there are some hackathons where I've seen the opposite of the case. So for example, like ETH Prague last year, they had some hella deep tech that didn't even have interfaces that ended up winning prizes. I would say, generally speaking, that's a minority of hackathons. So I don't know how ETH Rome will be, um, but that's just generally a tip. Um, And then what else? Also always scope uh, or always commit to do less than you want for your original scope. Like everyone overestimates what you can do in a timeline. And that's like the worst thing because then it really stresses you out. And then if you like don't even finish something that's minimum viable, but if you just like removed one feature, then you could have had something that was demoable. That's like the worst feeling. So just make sure that you can do that. 
yeah, no, I mean, it has been amazing having you, Kirsten, here also for this final tip set. I bet they, they, they will be super, super useful for hackers in hacking your protocol in, in Rome. So, Frank, I think that we are done. So, yeah, we are done. Thank you very much, Kirsten. It's yeah. a pleasure and, having me. Yeah, thank you. And of course, see you in Rome. Yes, <laughs> see you all in Rome. Okay. See you in Rome. Bye bye. bye thank Kirsten. you very much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Okay, cool. It's yeah. <laughs>